good. The tomato. Whether it's an heirloom straight from the garden or simmering in a spaghetti sauce, the tomato is so dominant that it seems like it must have always been a part of the American diet. But the tomato is actually a new actor on the stage of Western cuisine, first developed within the last 500 years. And in the 19th century, most Americans considered the tomato poisonous. But how did that all change? And where did the tomato really get its start? Italy comes to mind with its pastas, and Spain, and South America. That last one has a claim, it turns out, since wild tomatoes were first domesticated in Peru. But would you have considered Ohio as a possible birthplace? Probably not, even though Ohio itself may be the birthplace of declaring oneself the birthplace of things. The Buckeye State has claimed, for instance, to be the birthplace of flight, rock and roll, Alcoholics Anonymous, professional football, 4-H, Superman, and the hot dog. But what would it mean for the tomato to have been born in Ohio? I imagine a proud squash and his pregnant bell pepper wife awaiting the fruit or vegetable of her womb. But what is this new species? Wife, we shall call it tomato. It's all a little silly. That doesn't stop the residents of Reynoldsburg, Ohio, from staking their claim as the true birthplace of the love apple, as tomatoes were once called. And they feel secure in doing so because of this man, Alexander Livingston, a farmer, seedsman, and dreamer who toiled with tomatoes here in the 1800s. I wanted to know how his contribution supported the town's big boast. There was a fellow by the name of Alexander Livingston who lived over here on Graham Road, he had a little farm over there, and he grew lots of produce and vegetables and had a seed company. At the time, he cross-bred a lot of edible tomatoes to come up with a commercially viable uh, tomato. So Livingston was the one who developed the initial commercial grade, commercially uniform tomato many years ago, and that's where Reynoldsburg got its history as far as the place of the tomato. And he started noticing these little, what we call today, cherry tomatoes growing along his fence line. And he got involved in that and did sort of what I would call a Luther Burbank thing, where he started picking the biggest ones each year. He would get each, each little cherry tomato and he got them to be bigger and bigger and bigger until he finally came up with one that he thought was an edible tomato that could be used for cooking purposes. And from there the rest is history. At the Livingston House, you can learn all about Livingston's trials with the tomato, his attempts to make what was considered a wild and odious berry into a commercially viable product. But does his work make this a bona fide birthplace? Whatever we might think, the citizens respect the town's small piece of culinary legend. And what distinguishes their claim is that it is somehow both grandiose and humble, a mix that seems particularly Ohioan. My adopted state can make a show of itself, but often does so soft-spokenly. And that's Reynoldsburg, too. It's part bedroom community suburb of Columbus, part strip mall, part quaint little village, trying to maintain a slice of identity, trying to remain commercially viable and still somehow delicious. That it's the birthplace of the tomato is taken for granted here. It's not joked about. But neither is it held too fervently. Folks claim their town is the birthplace of the tomato the way some children claim their mothers are the absolute sweetest people on earth. About that sort of claim, there can be no real reason to quibble. And this particular tomato fiction is only meant to connect the residents to their pasts and to justify a party each August, a lycopene-drenched party known as the Reynoldsburg Tomato Festival. And at that celebration, it's easy to see that Reynoldsburg, birthplace or no, is a sweet little tomato of a town. Do they just get flowered, or do they get flowered and then, oh, they got and then they get breadcrumbs? Oh, they got all sorts of special secrets. They were delicious. I like your shirt. Thank you. You might even say that Reynoldsburg is the kingdom of the tomato. We are at the 2011 Reynoldsburg Tomato Festival in downtown Reynoldsburg, Ohio. And I am the 2010-2011 Reynoldsburg Tomato Festival Queen, Alexandra Frankie. 
and you have just given up your crown. Is that correct? What was this oh year gosh. tomorrow? What was this year like for you? Um, the year has been incredible. It's been such an honor to represent Reynoldsburg. Um, met so many different queens, tons of different girls, um, just awesome people. It was just a really humbling experience. Do you like tomatoes? I do like tomatoes. What's your favorite tomato dish? I actually had a tomato pie. It was like a quiche. It was, yeah, it was Excellent. really good. What advice would you give to next year's queen? Um, definitely be yourself. Um, it's just a humbling experience, and I can't imagine having done it if it wasn't something I felt like uh, I should be in, like, you know, a position that I should be in. Um, it was something that um, my faith played a huge role in. I couldn't have done it had I not felt this was the place for me to be. So just for every girl to be honest with themselves and, you know, with their faith and not to hide who they are, especially for a position like this. So. In addition to the Tomato Queen pageant, this year's 46th annual festival featured a flea market selling all sorts of tomato swag and, why not, a car show. Honestly, I'd expected more tomato aficionados, more concoctions, more focus, more food. But just as their native son, Alexander Livingston, searched for decades for the right tomato, festival organizers are still searching for the right blend of tomato idolatry and plain fun. Curiously, the festival has been a great source of consternation over the years, as antagonistic residents have squared off, wanting to be the ones who define what their tomatoey town should be all about. There have been troubles with the city, with sponsors, with bankruptcy, with weather, and aesthetics, and insurance, and utilities. This small town's tomato turmoil even made the national news. From, from day one, there has been rancor with the tomato festival. I'm not sure why. I just gave you an article a little while ago from 1969 where they had a, a complete blow-up in City Hall, and it even made, it went so far as making Paul Harvey news about uh, people having rancor within in the tomato festival group along with the city. It seems like everyone in the know is about an inch away from pointing a finger at everyone else. And a lot of this is political. So I know we've talked a little bit about um, the kind of politics of the tomato festival <laughs> and some of the things that happen in small towns. What's the, what's the kind of mantra in Reynoldsburg about getting into politics? In Reynoldsburg, there's, there was two ways to go about it. You either got on the school board or the tomato festival board, one of the two. That was your uh, foot in the door to get into the political arena here in town. And whereas a tomato queen will be chosen to represent the city of Reynoldsburg throughout the coming year, and whereas the Tomato Festival offers tomato exhibits, concessions, but the town's professional residents mostly forget any trouble on the third weekend in August. Of all ages, and, and though there's some room for ripening, this tomato festival eventually won me over. It was unassuming, simple, in no need of garnish. And it did what it needed to do, reminding a few thousand people about the collective, whimsical story they tell each other about their town and about themselves. What do you think the Tomato Festival has meant to the town? Well, I think it made it famous. Uh, uh, because it, it, they say it's the birthplace of the tomato.